Wonderful. Thank you. Please. All right. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nicholas DeMar. I'm with the Mahoney County Green Team. I've been at the Green Team for 15 years, and I've been an educator for two. Um, so basically, we're just going to go over a generic slide, uh, and then at the end, we'll fill in some questions and then maybe go into the details a little bit more. Uh, so. Dan, I'm going to let you. Oh, also, this is Dan Kuzma. Kuzma, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm horrible. And I've been at YSU for going on 23 years now, involved with the recycling program and also involved with the green team because YSU recycling gets grant funding from the green team, which is why we're doing this presentation together. Correct. So we're kind of getting connected with what we do. Awesome. So I'll step out and let you, let you go. Okay. You go to the next slide. So basically, uh, when we're looking at recycling, this is just a general primer, which most of you in this room are familiar with. Uh, we're looking at uh, you know, what it means to be green. Uh, that's something that people are talking about, sustainability, uh, something that's uh, environmentally sound. Uh, we're looking for practices that have minimal impact on the environment, obviously just living and doing our, our daily uh, uh, things and producing goods and providing services, we have an impact on the environment. So when we're looking at sustainability, we're looking at our quality of life that we value in the physical environment. And we're looking at sustaining that. So clean air, clean water, clean soil, all connected, all interrelated. Uh, next slide. So recycling, we're looking at energy consumption, uh, as well as waste management, landfills, uh, conserving uh, natural resources. Uh, that was definitely big in the 60s and the 70s. Looking at projections, uh, I always used to, when I, when I do presentations to students in class, I say, if you can go off and dust an old book off at Mog Library uh, from the 60s or 70s and look at predictions, uh, you know, when predictions were made, when we're going to run out of oil and different natural resources, they're going to be varied based off the theory. So, uh, recycling was one way to conserve natural resources, uh, uh, non-renewable resources particularly. Uh, also looking at energy savings as well as uh, extending the uh, uh, landfill life overall. Uh, next slide, please. So we're looking at uh, what I call waste resources, uh, making items from materials that are commonly discarded. Uh, that actually have a value to them after uh, their their uh, useful life. And so we've got aluminum, steel cans, newspapers, magazines, office paper, uh, which we call mixed paper and publications, uh, cardboard, uh, corrugated, as well as paperboard, uh, glass beverage bottles, uh, plastic uh, beverage, uh, food containers, not so much, but there's a, a plastic recycling uh, facility that can take multiple different things. So markets have changed. Uh, just due to where the materials are going. Uh, obviously, a lot of materials being shipped over into China uh, in early uh, 2007, 2008, uh, expanded uh, our recycling markets. And I loosely use the term recycling because we were sending them uh, way more than materials that were actually uh, getting reprocessed into newer things. Uh, so again, the, the, mar the materials that we can recycle are going to depend upon the available markets. And what we've seen now is with this shift, uh, with markets changing drastically and the, pande and the pandemic hitting, uh, is that we're kind of going back to what I would relate as uh, late 80s, early 90s recycling, uh, where we're just looking at speci specifically with uh, uh, residential recycling, just plastic bottles and jars in comparison to what we were uh, able to expand early on. Uh, next slide, please. So the recycling programs that we have available, how does it uh, get from one point uh, to another? Uh, we've got uh, curbside recycling as well as recycling drop-off sites. Uh, part of the grant agreement that we have here at the university uh, through the green team is that we operate a community drop-off recycling center. And you can find that in the Smoky Hollow uh, at the corner of Pearson and Adams. Uh, it's available to the public. I know businesses utilize it. Uh, we have residential curbside recycling that's offered uh, through most of Mahoney County, uh, rural uh, areas, rural areas are not are the exception. Yeah, so, um, and that's provided by the public waste services based off of a contract that was no negotiated. So it's at no cost, literally, to residents of Mahoney County. Uh, that's all subsidized by Republic Waste Services uh, to provide this curbside recycling based off of this agreement. So recycling is then picked up uh, from our drop-off sites or uh, at, from the uh, curb and taken to what's called a materials recovery facility. 
where everything is then sorted and separated by commodity and then sold to end users, uh, as we have some uh, you know, parts of the process mixed in here. Uh, individually with the scrap yards. Uh, you can take them, you could collect them yourselves and then drive them to the scrap yard. If you mix them in with the uh, general recycling, uh, they're going to go to a materials recovery facility and be sorted and separated and probably uh, sold directly to a broker, uh, maybe from a, uh, next slide, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, being bailed uh, at the materials recovery facility and then uh, being going to a paper mill, a steel mill, uh, any other location uh, where they're going to actually do the recycling process itself. So what we're doing here uh, in Mahoney County and here at YSU, we're just recovering the materials and we're providing a resource to help others and encourage others uh, to uh, collect these materials for recycling purposes. And then we'll make sure, you know, we make sure that they get to the uh, proper vendor uh, that can then pro properly recycle those. And we can look at uh, many products that we buy that have some type of recycled content within them. Uh, whether they're labeled or not, uh, you know, that's going to be uh, dependent upon uh, what we're directly purchasing. So it's intuitive that we have recycled materials that are going into uh, steel products that are being used in uh, transportation industries, as well as making appliances, uh, but many paper products. I know I specifically, uh, when I'm looking at waste paper products that I'm buying in my house, toilet paper, paper towels, anything that I need to use, uh, I make sure that it has a very high percentage of post-consumer recycled content. And then there's also industrial recycled content, which is great. It's cuttings that are uh, coming from the facility when they're making the product. But I really stress, and I know the green team stresses, post-consumer, because that's you and I actually using the recycling, and that's the recycling that's making it to the industry. The industrial cuttings, it makes sense. Uh, it makes economic sense for them to reincorporate that in there. But when you're looking at supporting these types of residential and commercial recycling programs that we have available, the post-consumer content is going to be uh, the ideal thing to look for. And the, the litmus test for it would be is if it states that 10% post-consumer, but I would even up it to 30% uh, post-consumer or more when you're purchasing these types of materials. So, you know, why do why should we recycle? Uh, there's arguments for recycling and against recycling. Uh, a lot of the against recycling has to do with economic aspects of it. Uh, and, you know, what we're looking at, you know, why we're doing it is because it's good for our community. It's good for the environment. Locally, we can get involved. Uh, we can support uh, our recycling organizations. Uh, we can also, you know, separate these materials and look at some indirect benefits. Economically, there's benefits for the local community, uh, not just for those uh, vendors that are processing the materials, but uh, if you have, if you drive a truck, you don't care what you're hauling. As long as you're hauling materials and someone's paying you to haul them, whether they're yard waste or food waste or any other type of recyclable material to get them from point A to point B to be further processed. Um, so we've got the economic aspect, but we can also look at the environmental benefits. So, uh, you know, valuable natural resources aren't being wasted. Uh, we're conserving those natural resources uh, as best as we can, especially if you look at aluminum, for instance, bauxite ore. Uh, is used to make aluminum. Uh, we don't have a very reliable source of bauxite in North America. Uh, so we have to go outside uh, of our area to get these resources. And so that saves on energy, that cuts down on pollution in the form of fossil fuels that are used to transport uh, raw material, to process the material. Uh, and so you're generating less pollution, saving energy, and also, too, the waste product isn't ending up in a landfill. Now, landfills have their benefits, obviously, to get rid of waste directly from our homes, from businesses, from areas where we live, uh, so that they can at least be safely uh, stored, uh, you know, temporarily. But in a landfill, you might get some methane gas being generated to, you know, uh, that's, that's uh, occurring to generate electricity, uh, such as the carbon limestone landfill in Poland, uh, Louisville area. Uh, and, you know, so there might be uh, some issues associated with the, with the landfill capacity itself. Uh, but, you know, recycling in, in, in and of itself uh, will reduce the amount of waste going into the landfill and hopefully going back into a circular economy, uh, going back into products that we're going to continue to buy. Uh, when that lifespan ends, then we recycle them again. And so we can look at the different types of natural resources that we use, renewable, non-renewable. Uh, so renewable would be something cutting down a tree, making paper, building materials. Uh, at a point in time, trees were a non-renewable resource because they were being used up faster than forests could be replenished, where they could regrow. Uh, but ideally, in a sustained manner, uh, the forests are going to be maintained and, you know, we're not going to see an issue with that in comparison to 
Uh, oil, for instance, as a non-renewable resource. We know that there's a lot of oil out there, but we don't know exactly where. So oil reserves are very few and far between uh, compared to the, no to the resources that are speculated to exist out there. And that's what makes oil a non-renewable resource itself. Uh, and to get them, we have to do mining, excavating, uh, drilling. Uh, you can look at, uh, you know, coal industry for, you know, we're in Appalachia. Uh, we have coal mining, we have a lot of industry, uh, but aspects to get coal, you know, blasting off the tops of mountains, doing different things that are creating uh, ecological damage in the surrounding areas. And so uh, what we're looking at is just trying to overall come, come you know, look at our uh, consumerism and our waste uh, disposal practices and look at some of the benefits uh, of recycling. As we talk about with bauxite ore uh, to, to make aluminum, I will give an example of some of the energy savings. Uh, it takes four tons of bauxite ore to make one ton of aluminum. Aluminum can be recycled pretty much indefinitely. Uh, re alum uh, recycled aluminum can be made into a new aluminum can within about a month, uh, about 60 days. Uh, these statistics are coming from the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the energy saved by recycling one aluminum can is enough to power a television for three hours. Now, these are dated uh, statistics. So that television is an old CRT monitor, uh, not one of the new uh, you know, LEDs uh, that's running off of less energy. So you could probably power that uh, LED uh, screen for quite some time off of the ener energy save. So that three hours is off of a very bulky uh, CRT monitor, uh, much older. And uh, Americans threw away uh, half a million tons of aluminum last year. Uh, and the year would probably be at the time. I didn't know. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's about exactly the same. Exactly it's, same. It's, it's, it's amazing how many millions of, of uh, how, much, how much money we waste just on throwing away aluminum. Mm -hmm. so, and that's based off of the scrap value prices. Uh, if we were, you know, bringing them to the facilities what we would get back. Uh, and then the energy needed to replace the aluminum cans to start in the United States uh, each year could power a city the size of Atlanta uh, for that year itself. Um, also, every ton of paper that we're looking at with recycling uh, uh, facts conserves the equivalent of 17 trees worth of uh, lumber. Uh, so, uh, did you tie in the county statistics or these YSU statistics? This is the county. That's kind of, I'll let you handle that one. Okay. So basically, every ton of recycled paper we conserve about 17 trees worth of lumber, about 8,453. <laughs> we save over 7,000 gallons of water, uh, 3.5 million gallons of water each year. It saves more than three cubic yards of landfill space, um, 1,485 1, cubic yards a year. Uh, in 2019, Mahoney County Schools recycled over 4 million pounds of paper. So throughout the county, we offer a program for all the school. It's a school-wide fiber program, and the, the schools are allowed to throw away um, any of their paper there. The only paper that we do not accept from the schools is construction paper. Construction paper or laminate paper, we do not, um, we do not collect. Um, but that also does, I don't know if that ties um, cardboard. I'm not 100% sure, but we, um, we do collect cardboard also. Um, know with the schools also, um, we offer a program called Cash for Cans, um, and that they're allowed to collect um, aluminum cans from from their community for their school. So each school has a collection. So Boardman Schools, each Glenwood, West Boulevard, they'll all be different schools, um, and they all compete against each other to collect, see who can collect the most. Uh, Metallica uh, takes them off our hands. Uh, cuts us a check back, and then we, at the end of the year, uh, we present that check to the schools um, for, for whatever else they want to use it for. Um, last year's winner uh, was Boardman Middle. Um, we only had seven schools participate last year due to the pandemic. Um, I'm hoping to get more schools um, uh, for this program now that we're kind of back to you know our regular routine. Um, it did start in October. It goes until April. So if you know anybody on the school boards or anybody that's interested in the program, it's open to any school in Mahoney County. Um, we also have rural areas that are participating in that also, so it doesn't matter. Um, uh, next slide. Okay. Go ahead. 
Um, so Americans generate uh, about four to five pounds of waste per person per day, which when you start to add up, looking at the total population throughout the United States, uh, that's quite a bit, more or less depending on the individual. Uh, about 1.3 pounds of that are food scraps that are being discarded. And uh, Americans recycle approximately 32% of their waste. So when we look at, uh, you know, uh, for instance, Youngstown State University, we have a, a between 68 and 70% recycling rate, uh, which is well above the, uh, uh, the uh, nation's average. Uh, however, that's because we're a small, isolated community. Uh, even though our population is shrinking a little bit, uh, we're seeing less waste, uh, you know, coming out of the campus, and so we're able to handle things a little bit better. Uh, but you know, 32%, you know, worldwide is it's fair, it's average, which means you know. But looking at the United States as a country, it's a very large area. Uh, the drive from coast to coast is 4,000 miles. Uh, Germany is about the size of the Ohio. So when we're comparing its apples and oranges based off of population size, uh, you know, geographic uh, distribution, uh, all sorts of things like that. And as far as food waste is concerned, uh, food, you know, organic matter is one of those things that we should keep out of the landfill. I know landfills, if someone was here from the landfill, they would say, well, we can capture methane gas uh, that's being generated. Uh, but when you look at climate change as a, as a huge issue environmental, uh, environmentally, uh, it's, you know, that organic matter is terrible. Uh, so keeping it out of the landfill is keeping get more detrimental uh, methane gas out of the atmosphere. Uh, so you could look at a landfill as a methane sink. Uh, again, if they're able to capture it and generate electricity, uh, that's you know a, a lot better than just flaring it off into the atmosphere, which a lot of landfills don't have the capacity to invest in the million dollar uh, recovery system. And so of more landfills that you see throughout the United States, for instance, would fall into that category uh, as uh, generating way too much methane due to the high organic matter. So we would push composting. And uh, as uh, Nick will probably talk about uh, the uh, plates and everything that you see as far as their zero, the green team zero waste efforts yeah. uh, are trying to minimize the amount of organic matter going into the landfills and then support composting efforts. Yeah, so basically we, we do host uh, composting seminars each year, um, but also the green team is willing to host if you have a private party, not a private party, uh, like a, uh, a party like this, uh, any type of event open to the public or anything like that, we will gladly help you out with getting compostable materials um, that we will end up taking up to the north side. Um, the bias you had an old earth Earth machine, I believe. Yeah. It was a, yeah, an old earth machine that's now um, up at the market on the north side where we take this up there and everything gets ground up and turned into a fertilizer. Um, so we do offer these programs for the public and also we do have a composting event that we try to host at least uh, once a year. And with that program, you do get a free compost bin for your house um, at the end of it. So you can definitely contact us and see if you're interested in the program. Uh, we should be able to let you know when our next one is. Um, but with the landfills, not all landfills are kind of created equal, uh, just just like Dan was saying. Um, I, I know in previous landfills that were built, they were not compacted the way they are today. Uh, a lot of the material was just basically dumped and then just buried over. And, you know, so basically you can go and then once they're sealed, you can basically go to a landfill that was closed in the 1960s, go to it, open it all up, and you can basically see all the material that was in there. It basically mummifies everything in there. You know, when everybody thinks, oh, the landfill eventually is just going to break everything down, it, it doesn't decompose as fast as you would think. Um, realistically, in my opinion, we'll be mining our landfills in the near future because it has all the materials and all the, all the, uh, resources that we basically need. So, um, but with this system, this is basically just a generic uh, of what a landfill is. Um, you'll see, we're definitely going to be monitoring the groundwater. Um, you'll, you'll have pipes that go down and they'll test this water periodically just to make sure that it's safe, uh, that nothing's leaching in. Uh, you'll see, the base layer should be, yeah, it should be a synthetic layer. Uh, you'll have you'll have your clay component first, and then you'll have a drainage, and then you'll have uh, your synthetic like a plastic.
plastic layer that row on top of that, and then vanilla thing of clay. It just keeps, there's a lot of checks and balances for this. And then once your material goes in, they'll cap it all off. Um, certain places will have only, you can only go certain heights. Um, some of them want to keep this flat. I know there are some people, some places that, you know, they'll make them high as a, almost a, a nice mountain, which I hope they don't do around here. Um, but usually what they end up turning these into after, is you'll see some of them will turn them into parks. Um, I know out west, they do have actually developments built on them because of the land situations out there. But usually they're just turning the parks or anything for uh, basically back like that. Um, yeah. Oh, right there. And about the landfill. Yeah. So you said that some will be used for parks or something like that. After, let's say that it's not put into a park or anything, later on down the road, it, after maybe so many years, can it be reused as a landfill again? No. Like they, they, they won't. Know? They won't. They won't reuse them as landfills. Wow. Uh, they'll move on to another somewhere else. Um, and just the cost of reopening, or, or I mean, basically, they buy the land and as they go. You know, it's just basically they know how many years they can get out of this. And uh, most of our landfills in Mahoney County, uh, a lot of it comes from out of state. They, they're they there to make money. So they're, they're, uh, their shipments mostly come from like New Jersey, you know, East Coast side. You'll see shipments come up. You know, so it's a lot of the waste that even though like you might think, oh, yeah, we're recycling and we're, you know, we're, we're not um, putting a lot of stuff in the landfill. The landfills are making the money. That's their whole thing. They, that's they're they're there to make money. So they know they need a certain percentage per month to make make them make them money. So they're going to hit that regardless of how much me and you recycle or not, because they're going to be getting those trucks from outside um, Ohio, which is nice for us, unfortunately, because that's how we're paid. The green team is served by tip, what's called tipping fees. Um, we're not on the county's budget. Um, we're, we're basically budgeted by what's uh, tipping fees from, from that. So um, that's how we make make our revenue. And, and then we just turn it back into, you know, helping everybody else recycle. So, so tipping fees, like fee. So each truckload, each, each tonnage that goes in, we get a percentage. Okay. And it's different. So out-of-state waste, because of interstate commerce, uh, out-of-state waste it has the same tipping fee as we do uh, in in uh, in our locality. So if you're out of district, you're paying more than you are out of state. Uh, so uh, Cuyahoga uh, that would want to dump in Mahoning uh, would have a higher tipping fee than say New York, New Jersey sending their waste in. So it's a, it's it's a tiered system. Uh, but again, because of interstate commerce with waste traveling. Uh, they can't charge any more than they would do uh, in in district, so that makes it uh, a little more complicated. Then the EPA takes uh, takes part of the tipping fee, and then the solid waste districts that are established in in uh, uh, in Ohio. There's 88 counties, um, so we have different setups for each each solid waste district. Well, yeah, but each county does not have a a landfill, so they might. The way they get their funding is going to be different than how we get our money. So you might go somewhere else, and they actually might be in, under the county's umbrella, you know. So uh, I know there's different counties that you know don't have the finances like we do. Um, I know our finances went down. Uh, I believe we used to have three landfills, and now we're down to two. Um, so I, I know we took a hit, and we had to figure out a way to just make everything work with what we had. Oh, okay. So these are just things that individuals can do uh, to lessen our impact on the environment. So we always, pre uh, you know, uh, preach, reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, obviously, we're talking about recycling. That's like a last recourse uh, about landfilling. So that would also include composting. Uh, waste reduction is key. If you can reduce waste, then waste isn't be being generated to begin with, uh, which means that you have less materials being purchased, less materials, uh, you know, coming out as a waste uh, going into the landfill. Uh, reuse, start supply, uh, you know, all these uh, options that we have in the area. 
uh, at least to get materials and another little bit of life uh, before they then reach their end capacity where they have to be handled and, and uh, disposed of eventually. And then what we have available, we recycle. And so uh, it can be kind of confusing uh, because we're really trying to pre uh, pre you know, tell everybody to reduce waste you know, ultimately uh, but then, you know, when you can't, you know, go through the, uh, that system and see, you know, how you can get rid of your materials, if you can't reuse them, <clears throat> can't recycle them, then obviously we have to landfill them or come up with creative ways to process them. Yeah, we're basically conditioned just to look at recycling. I mean, if you have, a, if I have a general conversation, I can start, I can start a conversation with a group of individuals, and I would say, what does it mean to be green? First thing out of everybody's mouth is recycling. Um, and it's completely wrong. And it, it's not really <clears throat> your fault. It's just what's been drilled into everybody's head. Um, you can look all around you, anywhere you go. You can turn on your TV, your radio, whatever you want to turn on. And they're always going to talk about recycling. Everybody's going to talk about recycling. But that's not what we should be focused on. The, what we should be focusing on is how can we, as individuals, reduce our carbon footprint before we get to this last step of recycling. Because recycling right now is only a band-aid. It's not going to solve the problem. Um, we're not going to fix the world by recycling. Um, basically, if we start at the beginning and we reduce our carbon footprint, so a good example of this, if you go home and you, you go buy a case of water, you're not really helping anything anybody out. You know, okay, so you're like, well, I recycled that plastic bottle. 80% of those plastic bottles that you recycle are going to be turned into something you're standing on right now. So 80% of the, of the water bottles is going to be turned into, into carpet, and we don't recycle carpet. After we get the use of carpet, it goes right into the landfill. So basically, anytime you play, uh, anytime you recycle plastics or um, materials like that, uh, the only thing that we know, steel cans, aluminum cans will get turned right back into, you know, steel, steel, aluminum, and glass will most uh, will be your best ones to get turned right back into what they are. Um, paper products, things on that such, um, you're still playing a percentage game of what kind of material they get turned back into. Um, but plastics are your worst. Mm -hmm. Plastics, uh, plastics are going to definitely be your worst about what what percentage of it. It's basically we plan brushing our life with it. So you, yeah, you, you might have this bottle. And you might think, yeah, next time I see it, it's going to be on, you know, right back on the shelf. It might not be. Um, so my focus is when I go and, and uh, I talk to groups or educate children or anything like that is basically how can we reduce our carbon footprint? And before we get to the recycling part, uh, so with that with that in mind. Any questions, any concerns? Any I, I would even add, I would even have to say the step before those three steps is refuse. Yeah. Refuse mm -hmm. to take something that you don't really need just because it's free. Correct. It's probably free because it's cheap. And when I say cheap, I don't mean inexpensive. I mean poorly made and intended to disintegrate and all the That's just my personal opinion. Real quick, what the Mahoney County does offer, we do offer a uh, uh, we do have tire drives. We, we have tire drives. We try to do everything that I'm, I'm stating. We do at least twice a year. We try to do a fall, I mean a, a spring and and a fall fall event each time. So you'll have um, a tire event. You'll have an appliance uh, an appliance and electronic event, and then we'll try to do a hazardous waste collection. Um, we do take batteries. The batteries are dropped off at your local uh, libraries. Um, we, we actually ship out an average of about 550 gallon barrels a month um, for alkaline batteries um, that we, we uh, ship to a company in the state of Ohio. Um, shredding events are done by Shepherd of the Valley. Uh, I know local police departments and, and, and uh, places will take back like any prescription drugs. Um, so that's another thing that we stress. Um, <clears throat> is there anything else I'm missing? Can think off of the top of your head. Um, I think that's pretty much it. So, quick question about paper. Yeah. Like, okay, so newsprint, I get. What about all that plasticized stuff? 
Mag well, here's the funny thing about it. Magazines are not made out of plastic. What gives that pla what gives that plastic look is actually clay. Yeah, they're about 30% clay. Yeah. So when you're looking at a magazine and it's nice and it got that nice uh, filmy look, that's clay. So it, it's it's recyclable. Now, the only thing that we won't accept would be laminate paper. So laminate paper would be, you know, anything that you, you would actually take the coating of plastic and put over time. But with the poly there is polyethylene in uh, food packaging. So uh, the paperboard that goes into the freezer or refrigerator uh, is going to either have a thin polyethylene coat on top, uh, or it's going to have a polyethylene mixed in with the fiber itself. It, it has, and, and they've gotten better with the recycling uh, of these particular boxes, at least with the labeling system. So the ones that have the polyethylene coat, uh, that can be removed easily for the recycling purposes, and it should say on the back, uh, you know, uh, for recycling. Uh, those that have the polyethylene mixed in with the fibers, that can't be separated in that process, and so it has to be uh, landfilled. But that would be the only technical thing that we would come into where you would have a fiber mixed with the polyethylene like that. What about, I, I've never, can you explain to me, for example, why they don't take cardboard at the same time? Or, uh, you know, uh, not cardboard, you know, like, uh, Packaging paper. Packaging paper. No, corrugated. 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 Yeah. Are you talking about at the drop offs? Uh, at the, yeah. at the, uh, no, at you, the curb. You, you can't, the reason why you can't stick it into your, into your, into your curb is because they want to be efficient. So, the, so basically, Republic's picking the, all these homes up. And because if you look at what Amazon has done to the United States, I, I think we're what 30, 40 percent increase of just cardboard alone. Uh, it's been insane. So when you think about what the average truck can hold, and when they go down the streets, it's it's for them. It's all about cost. So they're going to tell you what they'll take at the curb and what you need to take to their truck. And yeah. that's yeah. And that's basically what we still offer the service. It's just we just don't offer it at the curb. But eventually, um, some communities have the carts rolled out. Yes. So, um, and if, if you have the ninety-six gallon cart, now the only 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 place in Mahoney County right now that has a cart base is because the the city itself went and bid out, so they're not part of the free service provided by the green team. It's just the city of Struthers. Struthers is now a cart based service, but it, it's tied into their trash bills, so they're paying for it. But they're able to, you know, have that 50 gallon uh, toter and they, they might have different rules. I'm not 100% sure of exactly what all can be, if they're still allowing cardboard there. I actually have to talk to Kat on that one. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so basically that's what you're looking at. Yeah. Once the larger container systems like Cuyahoga and, and everything like that, uh, they handle the cardboard within cart so you'll see that yeah but we could be quite a few years off of transitioning yeah i live in kent and we pay we pay for our recycling our, re our recycling is part of our trash each month so any other questions very good i'm gonna stop you there because we have other people that no need problem. to go and i i, I apologize but thank <laughs> no. you so much for that because i did yeah. really like all of that was everything i really wanted to learn. Yeah. Yeah.